Welcome everyone to the MMA Viva section with me, Zane Simon, and my co-host Connor Rebish. We are here to uh, talk about this UFC Singapore fight card. Connor, Connor's already laughing. <laughs> just it's just the <laughs> the change in energy from very nice, lighthearted, casual conversation before the show. Show begins, and then as I, I hear you start to introduce what the card is, I can tell you you want to like this card more than you actually do, Zane. Yeah, I mean, that that's true. I think the thing is, is that there are a lot of fighters on this card that I enjoy more than they are good. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I think that's really like the the crux of it is that I don't dis like this card doesn't feel as soul sucking to me as the whole UFC trifecta of fight nights around the world that were just like Utica, Liverpool. What, what was it, Rio before? No, San, uh, Santiago, Chile, where it's just yeah. like. Man, it's just week after week of this card that I'm I, I was looking at and just like I don't care. This feels different in, in that I think it's like I don't know if it's more interestingly matched. If there are more relevant fighters, like uh, ones who feel like they could be yeah near some kind of relevance. Like for example, uh, I don't know Jessica Rose Clark. Yeah, she's maybe Jake, on the Jake cusp Matthews. of Matthews Jake has been Matthews. looking really good lately. Or even Lee Jung I mean, yeah, yeah, like they're Song Yodong. These are like fringe ranked fighters here. <laughs> there are fun fighters around that, like, I'm interested in seeing again. And, like I said, I like a lot of these fighters more than they are good, which yeah. helps pique my interest a little in a card that I will tell you flat out right away. For the for God's sake, if you do not have to stay up all night and watch this, if you're in North America, just Wait till tomorrow morning. Wake up with a cup of coffee. You've been asleep. You stayed off Twitter. You didn't see any results. Turn on Fight Pass. Hit play. And watch it all on DVR. And just enjoy that serenity. Do not stay up until... You know, stay, don't stay up all night for this. It, no. It's not worth no, it's I think and and in fairness, probably some of my good humor towards this card does have to do with the fact that we had a great pay per view and then a yeah. week off, yep, uh, a week with nothing, and so it's like okay, yeah, I could watch some fights on a Sunday morning. Sounds all right. Yeah, although it's Saturday morning, isn't it? Well, it'll oh, uh, is it happening? I think it, this this card's happening uh, late. Or like early, early Saturday morning for us, not early, early Sunday morning. Saturday at 4.30 a.m. ET, you're correct. Yeah. So it'll be Saturday morning then, which yeah. sounds even better, because I won't have to think about, you know, the weekend being almost over. It's going to be great. Yeah. yeah, sounds like a fun yeah. way to waste a morning. And a lot of the fighters on this card, too, aren't... I mean, so this is a common complaint, which to me, I mean, this is honestly, like, it's just a, you know... As somebody pointed out, the PFL card this week, in terms of depth top to bottom, is a better card than this one. <laughs> That's like, fair. Every fighter on every fight on that PFL card has somebody in it where you're like, oh, I know who that is. I've seen them fight a bunch before, even if it's like Vinny Magalash or something, you know? Mm -hmm. Um But this card, you know, it it also doesn't have fights on it like Cerrone Edwards or OSP Tyson Pedro. Like, it doesn't have even like the headliner of Will Bo Brooks versus Luis Firmino. You're like, oh, I want to see Lu Will Brooks fight this dude. Yeah. It's the matchups here will make it interesting. Like, the yeah. main event is a legitimate crossroads fight between yeah. a next, next generation and an old guard fighter. Uh, OSP Pedro is kind of the same thing. It feels a little softer, but a similar type. Like, I don't know. It's it's the matchups that seem interesting here, and not just like one fighter per matchup. In fact, yeah. the the one fighter per matchup rule doesn't really work for this card because a lot of these aren't established yet. They're just no. you have a reason to be excited about them, and you want to see them tested. Yeah. So, as, in terms of overall depth, the PFL card this week is a better card, but the UFC's got the matchups that we're really actually interested in. And, and, and um, you can afford to you have enough time to watch them both because of the way they're yeah. scheduled, right? Yeah, the way they're scheduled is great. And just you know, ignore this one live. Watch it yeah. on tape delay. Enjoy that. Enjoy a cup of coffee with it. And we're gonna dive into the bottom with a flyweight bout between 
uh, Janelle Lausa and Uka Sasaki. Which I think is case in point of why I like this card. This is a, a really intriguing matchup. Neither of these guys is like right on the cusp of a title shot or, or even um, near something like that. But both guys are have proven themselves to be quality fighters in this division. It's an They're always fun fighters. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And it's, a, it's an interesting style clash, I think. Um, yeah, the thing with Janelle Lausa is he's like um, a flyweight Jimmy Manoa. Mm-hmm. He's like big single shots, largely. He's actually a pretty competent uh, counterpuncher when he wants to be. Yeah. Uh, and can throw some nice combinations, but for, whether it's because he's worried about longevity he's worried about maintaining his stamina or he just doesn't like to be in a scrappier fight than that he can be a little um predictable and a little slow paced as a result where it's yeah. just not a lot happening yeah um kind of a big problem for flyway like if he were a yes. featherweight with that style yeah he could do pretty well but or if he were a much bigger puncher he, he yeah. could do pretty well but he he's got pop but he he's not like a one-shot knockout artist or hasn't proven to be through most of his career so far. And even at flyweight, guys who have that kind of pop don't tend to fight that way. Uh, yeah. Other than, like John Dodson. If you're gonna, you can be John Dodson, I guess, but then you have to be like way off the athletic freak yeah. end of the division. Yeah, and um, and the, the funny thing about the guy he's fighting, uh, Uluka Sasaki, is that uh. Before he came to flyweight, I mean, he first of all, he's a gigantic flyweight. His frame is crazy for this division, which we will also get to say about a guy further down the card, Naoki Inoue. Yeah, he, I, also, I just realized Sasaki's like an inch and a half shorter than me. That's insane. Yeah, for yeah. a 125-pound fighter, um, I'm sure it's not an easy weight cut, but uh, it does seem to have had like a positive effect on how well he does in his fights because before coming to flyweight, he was mostly getting lit up by strikers and was a, a submission grappler. And his problem at flyweight has been getting held down and outpositioned by better submission grapplers, whom he often has pretty good success against on the feet. Yeah. Um, the, the huge reach advantage at flyweight. I mean, it's clear too, he's worked on his striking mm-hmm. uh, and has a little bit of like a sort of Diaz esque um, flavor to the way he throws his hands. He reminds me of Nate uh, uh, Diaz a lot in a lot of ways. Um, I think that Sasaki might be able to work at enough of a pace to give Lausa problems here. There's there are, there are obvious ways for Lausa, like if Lausa can chop the legs, and but like really, it's been Sasaki being neutralized on the ground that has stopped him in most of his flyweight bouts so far. And if he gets a fighter who will let him stand on the feet, and he has the reach advantage and the wherewithal to use it, I think he could probably win this on volume. Yeah, I worry a bit about the fact that he tends to come in throwing busy strikes. Like, he he comes in, you know, throwing, like, his three punches and a low kick, which is good, but he does it, you know, with his head way up on a on a platter. And so there's a big chance that Lausa could just catch him coming in hard. But beyond that, Sasaki's just a much craftier fighter. Um and he's a pretty good wrestler and grappler when mm-hmm. he's not at an ex- when he's not dealing with an extreme disadvantage of skill there. Like, yeah, I think it's quite likely we see him a, l- a little bit of the return of like that dominant submission grappling yeah. in a matchup like this. It's just that the last two guys who beat him were Wilson Hayes and Juicy Formiga. So, yeah. infinitely better g- grapplers than him. But yeah. like in the Scoggins fight. You know, Scoggins did well to get some positions on him, too. But there's, like, a nice moment in there where Sasaki, like, got a body lock and hit this nice little trip and drag along the fence and, thing, and you know, things like that. And then ultimately was able to use Scoggins' own energy on the ground against him. Mm-hmm. And I think what the big thing is with Lausa's low output and own tendency to wrestle when he wants mm-hmm. to show he can change things up. You know, he's kind of got that, like, the regional, oh, I do everything game where it's like, you probably really should just stick to boxing, but you're used to beating up much worse fighters than you. So you're like, I'm going to hit a takedown. Like, yeah. why? why? You Which you could if you were, yeah. you know, a better wrestler. Like, you got yeah. to invest in wrestling before you try to be this well-rounded at this Mostly level. Mostly, he, he just, Lausa really fights like he's a very good athlete who got used to being way better athletically than everyone else around him. Yeah. 
and that should be able to help all those combination of things should let Sasaki get into his grappling game. If this becomes a fight between Laos's power and Sasaki's uh, volume, I'll lean Sasaki just for being a little craftier and busier, but not with any real certainty to it. Yeah. I'm with you. So yeah, it should be a fun fight though. Like, I don't think either guy quite like. I don't think Sasaki has the physicality to just control Lausa, and I don't think Lausa has the technique to just really break Sasaki. So it should make for a fun back and forth. Yeah, both guys are going to hit each other a fair amount, fairly yeah. cleanly, I think. Uh, Sasaki is the favorite here by a good margin. Opened at minus three sixty five, adjusted up to minus two seventy two, and has slowly drifted down to minus two ninety two. Uh, Lausa opened at plus 255, dropped down to plus 225, and has slowly risen back up to plus 235. Uh, that's fair enough. Lausa really hasn't had any success against um, UFC competition to speak of. But it is also worth knowing that the two people he's lost to in the UFC are much, much better natural athletes than Uluka Sasaki. So. Yeah, and, and and to to just to rain on Uluka Sasaki's record a little bit, um, the guys he's beaten in the UFC, kind of the guys that like would lose to a guy like Uluka Sasaki. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's not a huge Other shock. Than Justin that just, Scoggins, which is just kind of even there, like it's not a huge shock. From- that Justin Scoggins is doing well and then gives up a choke. That's yeah. kind of also a tendency of his. Yeah. So there is, there is, it is worth saying that Lausa hasn't beat very good competition, but that doesn't necessarily mean he matches up poorly with the Sasaki here. Yeah. Uh, that brings us to a woman's flyweight bout, Ji Young Kim versus Melinda Fabian. And this is kind of a, I mean, I kind of feel like Jiang Kim got gifted a decision a bit against um, Justine Kish. Thought she may maybe it's arguable that she landed better shots, but she also just kind of got totally outworked in every round, and nobody seemed to get hurt in that fight. So it's hard for me then to give a lot of credit to landing the better shots. She, she got out hustled. Yeah. And this is very much then a rubber meets the road fight on somebody who should be a pretty good athletic prospect in Ji Young Kim, but has a style that lends itself to close, ugly fights. Which is mostly to say that she's entirely dependent on being an accurate counterpuncher that moves backwards and is doing that in a d- division where power doesn't tend to pay dividends. Yeah, and she really fights like a puncher, and she doesn't seem yeah. to be that much of a puncher. She really seems yeah. to, her style expects huge results when she lands, and that's just not what you get. Exactly. It's like she's very clearly sitting down on single power shots or you know, just triggering counters off of combinations from her opponent. And when they're not giving her anything easy to hit, she doesn't throw. She gives up space. She's willing to back off really easily and be pushed. Um, And especially because of that, she's really easily able to be bullied against the cage and just bullied out of positions. And Fabian is a fighter that wants to bully. She wants to pressure. She wants to throw a lot. She's big and she's a long kickboxer with a lot of range. She's also a really ugly technical fighter. Just <laughs> there's a lot of busyness and there's a she looked better in her fight against um um I can't remember her name now. Melinda Fabian? Yeah Melinda Fabian looked better uh, Deanna Bennett. Deanna Bennett she looked better in that fight, but we've also seen from Bennett that Bennett is a, an amazingly uncomfortable kickboxer. Bennett. And Bennett's not fun to watch fight. <laughs> no. I've watched two of her fights now in recent memory. And... She was kind of fun early in her Invicta run. And then it just seems like the more she's fought, the more safety prone she's gotten. Yeah. And... I honestly I think I I think I thought that fight was Fabian's because yeah, say what you did. will about 
every single time Bennett went for a takedown, Fabian spent two minutes with her butt against the fence, but she was not ever, she didn't stop throwing strikes at any point. So there's a chance that Fabian being, just being busy Mm -hmm. against somebody who's willing to give ground like Ji Young Kim will win Fabian the fight. But she comes in so wild and upright and unstructured and just is wide open for the kind of counters that Ji Young Kim really wants that I'm, I'm not. And she's so, she looked so bullyable in that Bennett fight. Like it wasn't like, Oh, I come forward and then I have the advantage that I can press. It's like, no, you just got turned and put on the fence and sat there for a couple minutes before you could get off it and do any work again. I don't necessarily think that Jiang Kim is going to press that game, but it doesn't give me a lot of faith that Fabian can put on a consistent pressure performance. So I'm going to lean Jiang Kim here. She's better technically. She's more accurate. She, I think, probably hits a bit harder. And, but it's just, it's absolutely a, for Jiang Kim, it's are you an aggressive enough and composed enough fighter to win because otherwise there are a lot of women out there who can fight like Melinda Fabian. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we'll also, I mean, a lot of this too, does kind of depend on how good Fabian's chin is. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, again, it doesn't seem like Kim is a massive puncher, uh, or even a really authoritative one. (laughs) Like she, again, her style does not, uh, her style expects a lot more power than she seems capable of delivering. But, uh, so I don't know. The thing is, the, the one of the major factors in this fight, as you pointed out, is that Fabian is so hittable. She's yeah. like, she is bolt upright. She comes forward with like, she's got a very Carlos Condit way of approaching a striking exchange. Yeah, it's like, like if Carlos Condit had, if, if Carlos Condit is like a spinning top, like a wind up toy that you just like let go and everything works perfectly. Fabian is like that if, if like half the gears are broken. You just, you just wind it up like a quarter of the way. Uh, so it, yeah, it loses some of that zest. Um, but it, she does like one of the reasons she does remind me of Condit a bit is, is she's also, she's a lot wilder in some ways than Kim, but she's also a lot more creative with her striking. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Kim is like pretty much just hands yep. and it's mostly just the right hand, the right straight and the left hook. Yep. And, um, she doesn't really like her combinations are right, left, right, left, right, left, just with the hands with very few exceptions. Yep. And to the point that Justine Kish was like slipping her shit in yeah. their fight, Justine Kish, who is not known for her defense or her head movement was timing Kim's shots by the third round of their fight. Um, and Fabian, like uh, she's got a good kicking game. She's got, she'll go for weird spinning stuff. She's just a lot more like, any way she thinks she can hit you, she'll go for it. And um, I can really see that being effective as a, as a fight goes on. Um, I think I'm going to go with Fabian here. I, I'm waffling, yeah. so I, I really I, could see either one winning this. But It worked for Lucy Pudilova, and Pudilova right. is also not any kind of great athlete or technical yeah. wonder kid. And Fa- Fabian's record is a lot less attractive than uh, Kim's in terms of just the numbers. It's it's almost a 50-50 record. but. Uh, there is a fight with Lucia Pudilova on there that actually stands out to me because it was a 25 minute bout in which she yeah. lost a split decision. And no, I will never ever watch that fight because I'm sure it was ugly as sin. But yeah. this one stands a good chance of being ugly too. And I think if Fabian can go 25 minutes and narrowly lose to a scrapper like Pudilova, she might be able to outscrap somebody like Kim down the stretch. So I'm going to go with her. Fair enough. It's a style matchup thing. Yeah. No, I, it is. I just, it's just like Jian Kim is so clearly a much better athlete with much better technique. I'm just yeah. like, ah, I can't. This is, you have to prove you can win this fight because any, if you can't, anyone can beat you. The UFC can put anyone in front of you and they'll have a really good chance of winning. And my pick does essentially mean I'm saying, like, well, this is an IQ test for Kim and I don't think she's going to change. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, like, really, all she needs to do is just fight a little differently, and it'll be a much more forgiving kind of fight for her. Yep. Uh, odds for this. Are there not odds for this bout? I think it they just, just recently it got added. I think they just left this fight off of the <laughs> odds. I think oh. it just got added really recently. 
Oh, do it. if if I refresh, is it there now? Nope. Nothing. No. Man, maybe I'm actually thinking of the other uh, women's fight on here where uh, one of the fighters pulled out just before. Oh, Yan Jianan versus Vivian Pereira? Or, yeah. oh, Pereira is a replacement for Nadia Kassem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was still like a month and a half ago. Or a month ago. Anyway. I don't know. I just pretend to pay attention. All right. So no odds for some reason. Jian Kim, Melinda Fabian. Odds makers just said fuck that fight and we don't have any odds for it. <laughs> Uh, that brings us to a flyweight bout Matt Schnell versus Naoki Inoue. Okay. Um, so Naoki Inoue, the other super tall flyweight I've mentioned, and uh, one that I definitely am interested in seeing fight again. He has a little bit of that like Zabit Magomed Sharipov sort of cruel, cool demeanor to his mm-hmm. fighting style. Uh, seems to know how to use his length very well. Um, like Zabit, he's surprisingly good defensively for somebody with his frame. You kind of expect those guys' heads to be easy picking on top of those tall shoulders, but he understands his distance quite well, uses his reach well, and is also really well-rounded. He's got a great top game. He's a good guard passer and a, a, a legit submission threat. Plus, like a lot of these new long, tall fighters, a savage ground striker. His ground and pound is really nasty. Uh, and it's kind of hard for me to see Matt Schnell winning a matchup with all of those factors against him. Um, even though, like, since Matt Schnell came into the UFC, I've been thinking, you know, this guy's good. He's 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 actually got a lot of potential. He seems to be a good athlete. He's got a really good frame. Honestly, I like, uh, I think Phil McKenzie may have suggested this to me recently, but um, Matt Schnell might just want to move up to bantamweight or something. He tried uh, that. Well, he had one short notice fight yeah, with Rob yeah. Font. He, he fought Rob Font once. I mean, the problem for Schnell is that even as a flyweight, he's got a bad chin. That's why I'm thinking he and, might want to go up. Yeah, but bantamweight is much more filled with like yeah, good, it's unfortunate clean, hard punchers. <laughs> bantamweight is completely for no reason just filled with with devastating knockout artists. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, but still, you know, like it does seem to be his chin is really holding him back at, in this division. And, uh, like the Rob font knockout, not so bad. The Hector Sandoval knockout, like just getting devastated by hammer fists. Sandoval is a good puncher, but, but still, um, in a way can finish people like that. And, uh, and Schnell, Schnell has not, I don't think yet proven to be that, that dangerous. I will say in his fight with Marco Beltran, his, his boxing looked a lot better. Um, a lot more thought out he he was doing a nice job of constantly creating angles Uh he was working off of his jab and some feints he was doing a pretty good job but uh he's gonna be like matt schnell is also a guy who i think is used to having his own reach advantage Uh and let me just double check but i'm pretty sure that naoki in a way outreaches him no he actually doesn't he's actually an an inch and a half uh, reach on in a way so i don't know could be close. I just don't think in a way is going to accept um, a relatively slow pace. Yeah, and, well, the, the thing with Schnell, I think, is that he's trying very, very hard to work himself into being just a counter puncher. Yeah. Because then he doesn't have to put himself in danger all the time. Yeah. And part of what we saw in his fight against um, Marco Beltran really looked like two guys who realized that they don't really have the durability for... Uh, to take good shot, uh, solid shots, and that fight was very much like we're both gonna stay ten feet out, and then every now and then one of us will sit down on something. It was a sparring match. Yeah. Um, in a way, probably won't accept that as much. He much he's a much busier come forward puncher, but he really has no power. I mean, saying he can finish people like that, he never has. He's, yeah, that's fair enough. He's never knocked anybody out. Um, I mean, he he does. I think he does some pretty substantial damage on the ground. Uh, sure, in a lot but of it's fun. not the kind that finishes anyone, at least not yet. And it Ma- if makes him makes him give up you, their necks. Usually, if the, if he was going to, it would be the kind that would have finished bad fighters regionally. True. Um, I do kind of wonder if this is a bit of a mi- mirror match, like. We don't really know how Naoki, like, we don't know if Naoki Inoue might have all the same durability problems as 
uh, Matt Schnell as a super tall flyweight and just, you know, but fought much worse competition on Japanese regional circuit that wasn't going to test him. That's true. I even, I think I remember there's a fight he had, might have been the Yuya Shibata fight, uh, where he just got like absolutely knocked out and then fought his way back to a win. Mm. Um, so we're, maybe, we're praying he doesn't know that yet. So yeah, maybe he'll... he doesn't know that yet. And he doesn't fight like he knows that yet. Because otherwise it'll be Schnell Beltron again. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I, I do wonder, like, Schnell's a good, crafty grappler himself. But I think probably that's where this fight really has the the potential to change up. Is that if Inouye is willing to press Schnell... When Schnell gets pressed or when he feels like the fight isn't quite working right on the feet, he just starts to get aggressive and flurry. And that's where he's been really hurt and knocked out. It's like he just got into, he just sat down in the pocket with uh, Hector Sandoval and like grabbed a collar tie and was like, I'll just go punch for punch with this dude. And uh, I don't know that, and, and if he does that, like, I don't think he's going to get knocked out by Inouye, but I think he will initiate the kind of scrambles where it'll be clear that Inouye is just a better grappler than him. So mm. I'm picking Inouye mostly because of that. Um, I, I think this could be a pretty even stand-up battle with Inouye coming forward behind slightly cleaner uh, leading strikes, but Schnell pulling the trigger. He's got he's got fast, clean counters. He's not... yeah. yeah. Like like Not I said, like Schnell, Schnell has a lot of good things going for him. Like he's yeah. he's got quick hands. He's he's very agile. It's just I don't know. Every time something awful seems to happen, or as in the case of the last fight, nothing seems to happen. So yeah, I think he's got like he's got very good situational tools. It's just that I mean durability is going to be a big problem. Yeah, and, and he seems to wind up in bad situations. Yeah, where like and, and are you expecting essentially that like Schnell is going to his old habit of playing guard too willingly is going yep. to really yep. bite him here. Yeah, I, I think that anyway is going to press forward. Schnell is going to suddenly try to blitz him. They're going to tie up. Inouye is going to start trying to wrestle him. Schnell is going to be willing to play guard. They're going to get into a grappling match and then anyway is just going to be better. That That's my feeling. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Odds on the fight... Schnell is the underdog, opened at plus 125, adjusted up to plus 175, drifted back down to plus 160, and stayed right about there. Hasn't moved at all off that. In a way, opened at minus 165, adjusted up and down to minus 213 or so, adjusted up to about minus 200, and is currently at minus 193. So those odds have not moved much since they opened. Uh, that takes us to a woman's strawweight bout, Yan Jiaonan versus Vivian Pereira. So this and one is her is a replacement. Viviana Pereira is replacing uh, Nadia Kasem. Yeah. Um, this is I. I kind of like this matchup. I I, I think I, I don't know that it, I, I'm I'm not sure how it'll play out. Yeah, I I think that I don't know. I mean, I I kind of wish that. Kasim was in there instead because Kasim's such a technical mess that uh <laughs> Shaunam would have been able to light her up. Well, she might have been able to light her up, or it would just be like it would be a it would be a real sounding board for both people. This still is, but it's much more this is now much more of a sounding board of Vivian Perriera. Mm. The whereas the original matchup was like two styles that just Yeah, two <laughs> aggressively messy fighters. Coming yeah. together, and you're going to see who's more composed, who can fight, you know, who can take the fight where they need it. Can Kasim get takedowns and be the much better grappler? Can Zhao Nan stay on her feet and light her up? Now it's Perriera is the much, clearly the much better schooled, more consistent, more athletic, po powerful fighter. But she's really into this whole hyper slow pace outside pick my shots kickboxing match where she doesn't display it. She's you know she's got a little she's got some clean technique and a little power, but it's nothing near enough to 
really light anybody's world on fire. You she, know? She, she's like a female Drew Dober, but like a couple stages back in Drew's career. <laughs> yeah. Like when he was just a tiny Michael Bisping. Yeah. Um, and she, so really for her, it, for Perrier, it's all, can she get, can she press Zhao Nan against the cage enough and make that turn into takedowns? Yeah. Or if this gets out to a range kickboxing battle, is Zhao Nan just going to outwork her with volume? Yeah, I think it's it's still interesting because it adds the layer of like, what does Zhao Nan do if the opponent doesn't just give her openings? Yeah, like uh, like Kylan Curran yep. kept doing in their fight, and like Nadia Kasem would have done. Kasem, yeah, Kasem would have been more fun, more fun because yeah. she would have been landing shots while giving lots of openings. Uh, yeah. To a good athlete with really quick hands and a tricky rhythm, and a fighter who is very, very willing to brawl in Yan Shanan. Like it, 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 there were a few moments in that Kylan Curran fight where she literally just outpowered Kylan Curran. She's like, "Okay, she hit me with two. No, that's three punches in a row. Okay, time to start trading." And then just backed her off by hitting her harder and cleaner. Yeah. Um, and she's I, not going to. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I kind of feel, I, I kind of got to lean into picking Perriera here. Just yeah. Just because of that physicality and like the ability, if she can just stick her on the cage and grind on her, this could be an. I mean, this is a has ugly split decision written all over it for me. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, I the thing is, I don't really feel like I know how sh how Shaunan, um creates that pace when it's yeah. not given to her. Yeah, she might be able to. If she, she, I mean, she she seems to move really well. She might be able to get out there and just blitz Pereira. And Pereira has often been like so reticent that she might just let rounds or minutes of rounds at least slip away. And yeah. she's, despite her like extremely impressive frame, she does not really seem to have that much pop. So, yeah. um, if somebody, if she's she's de decidedly the less dangerous fighter in this matchup. But if she does just decide to hold Shannon against the fence, like Kyla Curran got pretty close with some takedown attempts. Mm -hmm. Pereira is like a better athlete and ja a better wrestler and grappler. Shannon also displays some really terrible basic fight IQ stuff. That's just a fighter who's so willing or who's so used to once again, like Laos said, just will, used to being the much better athlete and the much better schooled fighter on any against any competition she's faced. Where it's just like, oh, you want to hold me against the fence? Well, what if I just tried to throw myself on the floor? What would you do then? <laughs> you know? What now? And it's not really a challenge or a threat of any kind. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she does get through, like, it's clear Pereira is a thinking fighter. And yeah. Shaunan, like, that exchange against Kylan Curran, she gets through on, on pure athletic feel. Mm hmm and uh, and it's not really that developed just yet. Yeah, I think I might side with you. I think I'll go with Pereira, but Pereira does so little sometimes that oh, if Sha okay. Sha like I, say, I, I think it's going to be a split decision where we're just splitting hairs again of like, well, she held her against the cage for three minutes and then got outstruck two to one for one minute. You know. I think if I think if Pereira is smart, she will take a do nothing but like she'll have a two range kind of approach yeah. where she does not hang around in the pocket. She kicks the shit out of Shaunan's legs from long range and then she holds her against the fence in the clinch. Yeah. And just avoids mid range at all costs. Um yeah. I'm I, I would like to see Yan Jaunan win this fight. And if she does, I think it'll be um fun. <laughs> more fun. Yeah. But it would it would be kind of a kindness for her to win this fight just because Perrier is so low output. Like, I don't know. Like, I don't feel like part of me is like, oh, if ja Yan Jan Nam wins this, oh, that'll be, that'll say really good things about her and her ability to to win big in the UFC. And it kind of will, but it'll also just say a lot about Vivian Pereira being so low output that yeah. you have a close fight with Jamie Moyle for no reason. Book's not closed on Pereira just yet, though. She's, no, she's 24. Yeah, she's young um, and she's got a lot of improving to do. It's just she, she might turn out to be Lady Jimmy Rivera, where it's yeah. just like a whole long pre UFC career that's just like nothing but boring fights, and then suddenly, oh, I can punch. Yeah, uh, which she looks like she must be able to crack a little bit. 
She just yeah. hardly ever seems to try. <laughs> Uh, all right. Odds on that one. Yan Nan is the underdog opened at plus 170, adjusted up to plus 209, and has been falling pretty consistently since then down to plus 145. And Vivian Pereira opened up at minus 230, adjusted up and down to minus 202, and has been climbing consistently since then up to minus 174. Honestly, those odds should be close to even as far as I'm concerned. Um, Perriera only has two submissions in her entire career. They were both arm bars, which suggests she's getting them off her back. Maybe not, but that's what it suggests. And otherwise, all of her knockouts come really early in her career. And she hasn't stopped anybody in a while. So... She's going to carry this, likely carry this to a decision, and it's going to be a close one. One of those knockouts against a female boxer due to Jankovic. Yeah. Weird. Uh, yeah, it's a strange record. Um, That brings us to a welterweight bout, Shinsho Anzai versus Jake Matthews. Take it away. Okay, I like this one. Um, Again, I'm, I'm okay with most of this card. I'm back to being optimist, Connor, now that those, those three oh, god-awful Fight Night cards are behind us. Um, I think that... Uh, I think, like, Jake Matthews sort of re-inspired some confidence with his fight against Li Jingliang. He, he really did. Um, and a lot of that confidence for me, I think, stems from the fact that he was an ogre made of stone in that fight, whereas previously he'd been just a, a, a young man. Mm. Uh, he grew like twice his size before yeah, that he, fight. He like it suddenly just matured. His back was crazy wide, and he just looked massive compared to Li Jing Liang. He did grow um, like five inches in his the course of his UFC career or something. It was growth spurt like a legitimate yeah. growth spurt for a 23 year old man i guess it's not really a surprise but even um, still, going up to it, it makes you feel a lot better about him going up to welterweight it's like okay yeah. he's he is going to be a middleweight someday probably so this is this makes sense uh that was I'm, i guess i'm all over the place with my esoteric references to other fights but that performance from him was very much the same kind of performance that Kyle Bokniak had Mm -hmm. against um, Brandon Davis when he had his like coming out fight. It was like, oh, this is why we were supposed to be interested in this guy. Mm -hmm. It was all about the athletic, uh, making the most of his athletic advantages where he was just denying yeah. exchanges, denying exchanges. He, and he would explode in with two or three huge shots. Um, also very, very dominant with his wrestling and his uh, top game on the ground and was like, it had this very aggressive approach, but didn't have to work that much uh, and made the most of the fact that he was just very, very quick and, and just focused on being hard to time. Yep. And I don't know how he makes that work against a guy like Shinsho Anzai. He's, he's, yeah, he, that's, that is something I'm, I'm really interested in. Anzai has not had many fights where people have been able to get him off of them for long periods of time. And so it still feels like Matthews is going to have some strength to work with in the clinch uh, and his, that does seem an area of his game that, that is continuing to develop. But Anzai is, at his best, a pretty a crazy aggressive pressure fighter and um, can mix things up pretty well between boxing and wrestling. I don't think he's like a massive takedown threat to the likes of Matthews, but if Matthews is, having, is under pressure and having to worry about lots of different threats, then that's very valid. Yeah. So... I almost feel like I'm just kind of chickening out to pick Jake Matthews here uh, because I don't see like a clear path to victory for Shinsho Anzai. I think, and, and, and especially the fact that uh, I remember very clearly his fight with, ironically, I forget who it was against. I, I remember very clearly. Alberto Mina. Yeah, his fight with Alberto Mina. Uh, he may have taken that one on short notice, but he gassed really badly and couldn't. he just couldn't stop himself from yeah. fighting the way he was fighting. And that's more of an issue is Jake Matthews is like a young man who seems to be really well conditioned. And um, even if he's having to answer constant threats, if Anzai can't keep that up for more than like a round and a half, at what point does he just start blindly walking into some big shots and some big takedowns from Matthews? Uh, and then, you know, 
I, I have a little faith in uh, Matthew's submission ability on the ground too. So I'm going to go with Jake here. Yeah, I think the big thing, honestly, for me is just foot speed that mm. is probably going to push this for Jake in that he can he can stay on the back foot and make Anzai chase him and then dip into the pocket to land one or two big shots and get back out. Because that was the thing that we saw against um, Li Jinglong that he did really well that was kind of like the best new wrinkle in his game was the ability to drop into the pocket, throw a couple hard shots, and then get way out before mm -hmm. anything came back at him. Rather than just kind of getting in, throwing two or three shots, coming in on a straight line, and then be like, oh, safety valve, I better shoot a takedown. And, you know, suddenly get wrapped up into a fight like that James Vick fight where he just got, you know. Yeah, we've seen flashes of it from Matthews before. Like his yeah. fight with... um johnny case there was a fair bit of that too he was like really darting in and out but i don't know it didn't seem to really come back in force until Li jing young and suddenly yeah. he was like oh he looks comfortable in a striking match in a pure striking match i do worry though with like the especially the having the boyan vlitschkovich fight too that if matthews just absolutely cannot get uh on side down which could be very possible. Then how calculated and consistent a technical striker can he be? Yeah. We, because, uh, yeah, that's a good question. We haven't really seen him get to the point where it's like he, he's relying on technical skill. Yeah. Cause like even in the Li Jing Long fight, he, he like he hurt Li Jing Long several times, but like the biggest thing that kept that fight from ever turning was that he was also just able to take Li Jing Long down and then yeah. like snuff out offense there to stop any momentum from building. So if he can't do that, then I mean, I don't trust Anzai to be the same sort of like progressively better force that Li Jing Long tends to be at all. So I don't see that being as much concern. But it is interesting to think like Anzai is a good wrestler. Matthews is still kind of a skilled generalist. He's a decent grappler if you're not a better grappler. You know, like, if you're not James Vick or, uh, you know, um, Andrew Holbrook. Or he's a decent wrestler if you're not Kevin Lee. But he's not actually a consistently good fighter in any True. one area. Yeah. And now again, like the fight with Jing Liang was a standout athletic kind of yeah. performance, but he still has not proven that when you, you put him in the kind of fight where he has to rely on skill that he doesn't tend to kind of lose his shit. Like yeah. even I'm, Boyan Velichkovich made him look pretty bad. Yeah. Um, Just by, by forcing huge and tough and hard yeah. to control. Yeah, and like forcing him into these into pure wrestling exchanges and, and stuff like that. Yep. Where it's like, okay, how how deep does your skill set go? And Li Jing Liang, because of the takedowns and the speed difference, was not able to do that. Yep. But Anzai is he's probably gonna be in his face. So it's interesting. Yeah. I, I don't I don't think Anzai is also I, I also don't think Anzai is the kind of fighter to really force that out of Matthews. But he could be. He, I don't think he's big enough. Like that's the thing with Boyan Velichkovich is that he's just huge. Yeah, he's a huge problem to deal with because he's massive and he's tough. And he's really like being huge and hard to hurt is just like that makes you a a stupidly difficult fight for almost anyone. And Anzai is five foot seven apparently as a welterweight, so. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's bricked up, but he is not, yeah. not a tall man. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I'm going to take Matthews. I, I'm going to take his speed and his uh, slightly cleaner punching and his ability, his growing appreciation for timing to uh, carry him through this fight. But mm -hmm. it'll get interesting if he tries to take Anzai down to change things up and can't and just gets forced onto his back foot constantly. Yeah, and if Anzai comes out really aggressive, it might get interesting when it's like, okay, 
Matthews has been put on the back foot, made uncomfortable. How does he adjust? How does he take advantage of the fact if Alonzai slows down as the fight goes on? Or does it take him out of his element? You know? Yeah. Alonzai like is cur- currently a massive underdog, opened at plus 280, has risen just from the moment of opening, is now at plus 386. And Matthews opened at minus 400 and has dropped consistently all the way down to minus 520. Um, I think that's absurd. We've seen Matthews lose too many fights to just bank on him. Like, getting beat by Andrew Holbrook is bad. That's just all there is to it. James yeah. Rick and Kevin Lee, those are sensible losses. I mean, I don't recall anyone agreeing with that decision, but then I do also recall a lot of people disagreeing with the win over Velichkovich. So. Yeah. It's kind of tit for tat. He's had a tuck with Andrew Holbrook and Boyan Velichkovich is bad. How's yeah. that? The yeah, big thing it's... over that period, though, I will say over that period, he did apparently have hip surgery to like have his hip kind of like ground down because of his growth spurt or something. Mm. And he looked way better in the Li Jing Long fight. So maybe that's a major turning point uh, in that area. Like maybe those two fights are explained partially by that. We'll see. And he's just totally bounced back and turned an athletic corner since then. But seeing Jake Matthews as a huge favorite with fights like that on his record does not um, give me a huge amount, that that much confidence. Yeah. Uh, brings us to a welterweight bout, Song Kinan versus Hector Aldana. And uh, this should be a fun shit show. Um <laughs> That's just watching just watching Hector Aldana's tough fights while you say that. It's... Yeah. Hector Aldana Song Kinan, there's like a reason for him to be in the UFC because he's big and bricked up and he's got sort of a super generic MMA skill set and he's Chinese and the UFC's trying to break into the China market. And he had a really explosive, decisive debut in the yeah. org. Looked great in his debut teeing off on uh, Nash, Bobby Nash. Hector Aldana just looks bad. Um, he wades forward with like shift punches constantly, but not in like a cool, oh, you know how to shift punch way, but like. Not in an I'm throwing shift punches way, more in a my in, feet move forward because I have to catch myself every time I throw yeah, a punch. My, my, my feet, or my arms are dragging my feet behind them. And. Uh, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's a good way of saying it. And he can't defend a takedown to save his life. Like, every low single leg attempted on him results in him immediately falling to his back and then laying there for multiple minutes. He's aggressive as hell if he gets top position, but that also means that he's open up for submissions and to scramble out from under him and all that because it's just pouring on relentless dive into the guard, throwing punches. And it's been more than three years since he fought last. Yeah, it's been three years since he fought last. And losing to uh oh, who was what you're looking at his record. What was his last loss? Enrique Marin. Enrique Marin, who is a major sub UFC level athlete. The guy who was brought in to lose to Sage Northcutt. Yeah. I don't know why Hector Aldana's here. Song Kinan better smoke him. Um it'll probably be a war though, because it's not like Song Kinan is any sort of technical marvel he's just big and strong and knows yeah. enough basic stuff in all areas of mma to kind of get by um it should be a fun fight but it's definitely super low level yeah i, I can't really add anything to that <laughs> to be honest i, I think Song's power is going to be uh, decisive. I think his size, uh, being able to just side up a shot as Aldana comes in with like a, a really obvious one, two, one, two, one, two kind of combination. Yeah. He doesn't seem to have, I mean, there's very little evidence to go on. It doesn't seem like Hector has the same chin problems as Bobby Nash, but no. we don't really know. Uh, what his chin is like right now. And he he may have improved his game I a mean, great deal. He did get dropped him. instantly by that uh, Enrique Marin in that fight. True. He got caught with a knee, and yeah, he was no, he's he like got so off behind the ear with like a, a looping right hand, and instant, and then Marin threw the knee behind it yeah, as yeah, he's yeah. falling because he's so off balance. Like it doesn't really matter how durable you are 
Yeah. If you're going to. So, yeah, I think he's going to walk into some shit from Song Kinan. But again, Kinan is like, I time you perfectly. I hit you with the one big shot. What next? If he doesn't yeah. put Aldon out, then it's probably going to be a god awful mess. But uh, it'll be fun. Yeah. Uh, Kinan is a fairly large favorite, open at minus 165, adjusted down to minus 275 or so, is currently at minus 277, has not moved at all. Um, Hector Aldana opened it plus 125, adjusted up to plus 227, and is currently at plus 223, has not moved at all as well. Uh, there's no reason for Song Kinan to be a big favorite over anyone other than the fact that Hector Aldano just looks really terrible. So, fine. Whatever. <laughs> yep. I mean, I don't want Hector Aldano to be to, to like be more of a favorite, do I? No. So, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. That takes us to a featherweight bout. Rolando D versus Shane Young. It's a tricky one. Um, this is another one of those fights where it's like fighters I like, despite the fact that they're just clearly not very good. Yeah, I mean, all we uh, at least as far as the UFC viewing goes, all we have to go on for Shane Young is him showing off his defense and literally nothing else against yeah. Alexander Volkanovsky. Um, he still didn't come out of that matchup looking as bad as he could have because he was able to hang in there against a heavily favored, soon to be top contender kind of fighter. Um, but it didn't really tell us a whole lot about like how he'll approach UFC level opposition either. No. Uh, he came in on short notice and just got ragdolled as little as he possibly could. Um, and then Rolando D had a couple of uh, fights that went the wrong way, I think, in his starting his UFC career. And then he had a a win that doesn't really tell us anything over um, what's the guy's name? Waluigi. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Wuliji, Wuliji Buren. Wuliji Buren, yeah. Yeah, so uh, losing to Alex Caceres, Teruta Ishihara, again, not terrible losses. I mean, those are good fighters. And they then, were both fights that he looked like he was actually fighting his way back into them by mm -hmm. the end. Like, the Caceres fight, that was he got poked in the eye really early and yeah. then slowly fought his way back in, but his eyes pulled up and they, the doctor stopped it. And the Ishihara fight, he got dropped in, like, the first minute of that fight. And then uh, was able to, you know, got held down for a round. And then in, in the second and third rounds, worked his way back in while also getting a point deducted for groin strikes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's kind of hard to say, like, how good both of these guys are. All, all you can really go off is, is the style matchup. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't really make it any easier because it, no. it really depends how good they are. Uh, yeah. Like, Rolando D is very happy to do nothing for long stretches of time. Um, I wouldn't even say he's so much of a counter puncher mm -mm. as he is like a pot shotter and he just mm -hmm. wants you to, to slow down. And he's, I mean, he's good at that. He, he puts yeah. combinations together really well. He's got very powerful kicks and he can be kind of tricky with his timing. Sometimes he'll just straight up throw a shot, but he's also, he's kind of interesting. Got a really and, nice, really nice left hook. He does. He absolutely. Very. Yeah, and, and yeah, he, he puts his shots together well. It's just that there aren't a lot of them. Yeah. And the question is, is how, how effective is Shane Young going to be in forcing a different kind of pace on someone like Rolando D? I have seen some of Shane Young's other fights, and when given the chance, he does seem pretty aggressive. Um, when given an opponent who is really just backing off, he, yeah. will, he will build momentum as the fight goes on. But how does that change? if he's getting cracked in return with like much harder strikes. Yeah. Uh, and I do think that D is a significantly harder puncher. So don't know. I think D's yep. a better adapter and I think that's why I'm going to go for him. Uh, I think he, he just, just a little more creative. Whereas like say what you will about how, how well young defended against Volkanovsky, but he still got beat worse and worse as the fight went on. Uh, he was never, ever able to work his way into that matchup. And in other matchups, like he really needs a very passive defensive opponent who stays that way to get going. And the problem with D is that when he starts to get pressed, he will start firing back. If he really yeah. gets put, put in under duress, he, he's not going to let it slide. So I'm going to go with D. I think it'll be a very close kind of fight. Uh, could be. I mean, who knows? Maybe someone will get knocked out in an instant. But Yeah, my, my biggest concern for D, 
because I do like him a lot more just technically as a complete fighter. He's uh, he's one of those random fighters where I really enjoy watching his game work when it works, but <laughs> it's just also like you're probably not made for success at this level. Um, my big concern, honestly, is that he may not be durable enough to fight mm-hmm. the way he does. Like, Teruto Ishihara does crack, but just getting dropped instantly by him and, like, it's just, you know, he worked his way back into that fight, but it does make me worry that, like... I think he just needs to relax a little bit. I think he yeah. takes... He's so tense when he gets hit. Like, he's he has that, that Aldo coiled spring thing going on. Yeah. Like, just chill, the thing man. with Shane Young, though, is that Shane Young looks like even good fight, good performances he's had. Like we saw, I, I, you probably saw that brave fight he had against the dude who didn't technically look like he should fight anyone. <laughs> yes, I think I did see that one. <laughs> it's just like this really scrawny, awkward looking guy that just wanted to like fight Diaz style. But if you like stripped all the parts of a Diaz game that worked out and you just kind of had somebody that stood there and tried to throw punches. So it was, uh, damn it, who was that guy that Artem Lobov beat? Chris Avila. There we Chris go. Chris Avila, yeah. Um, the, 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 like the protozoal Diaz brother, like Diaz brother in fetal form still. Yeah. <laughs> Not even close to being fully developed. No. Um, the thing that I've noticed about Shane Young's game, and I think this is especially why he went away so hard against Volkanovsky and just didn't fight at all, because partially you could be like, oh, he's young, he's his debut and all that. But it's also, uh, like, he's been around for a while. Like, he, Shane Young... Five years at that point. Yeah. Like, he's been a pro fighter for as long as Volkanovski at that point. Mm. And the thing is, is that he tends to treat his fights like a sparring match. Like, if you watch his fights, like that fight he had in Brave, where it's just somebody who's clearly overmatched, and Young is just kind of like, pitter-pat, pitter-pat, like, here's a little, you know, everything is just kind of soft and really nothing behind it. And then every now and then he gets a chance to, like, sneak something in, and he'll find an opening for something really hard. And it's that sneaky. Like, he landed a good flush head kick that rocked his opponent and all that. But then he goes right back to sparring. And he went to a decision with the guy who's who. This is the guy from that brace challenge yeah. fight, Sita Letty, who was O O and O at the time, yeah. a complete novice. So, yeah. so it doesn't lead to him being any kind of finishing fighter because he's out there just kind of going through sparring rounds. Yeah, and otherwise he's reliant on a jujitsu and wrestling game that worked okay on the international Southeast Asia Oceana circuit, but we've seen so many fighters with that kind of wrestling and grappling come to the UFC where it's just like, oh, suddenly you don't wrestle and grapple anymore. Mm-hmm. You don't have that game. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, if, if he's not going to be able to just really knock, go out and knock Rolando D out, make him pay for a, a bad chin... He might be able to outwork him with that just kind of pitter-pat sparring style, but I think that's more likely to give D openings to land much cleaner, harder shots and more likely to scare Young off sitting on exactly. anything. Yeah, exactly. Like the, 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 the difference, I think the, the big difference here is the, the difference in how they respond to being pressed. Yeah. Where like it brings it brings some fire out of D and at least judging by the Volkanovsky fight, it causes Young to kind of shut down. Yeah, and I also wonder. I also feel too like D D tends to get better over rounds. So mm-hmm. if, if he can get time to time young, if Young's just showing him a lot of really soft, low power, low speed strikes, that it's just going to give him time to get get the rhythm down and get the feel for the no. fight. But also, no huge confidence in either no, guy. Like, no, no, Young like really could outwork D. Really have the output and probably not the durability to make his style work at this level. So if Young is just tough and can hang in there and throw a lot of stuff and occasionally land something really hard, he may be able to hurt D with the one good clean shot he lands per round, or he may just be able to outwork him. Mm -hmm. No confidence there. Um, (laughs) 
Rolando D is the underdog here for no real reason at all. Um, <laughs> opened at plus 135, ju- adjusted down to plus 120, and has risen since then all the way up now to plus 136. Shane Young opened at minus 175, adjusted up to minus 142, and ju- has gone down ever since to minus 164. I guess people really liked watching him get shit kicked by Alex Volkanovsky. That was a big confidence <laughs> builder. They were all very impressed by that. Yeah. Literally, uh, just, all right. just make it even. You don't have to set a line, and nobody bet. Don't bet yeah. on this. Just no. let it be plus 100 against plus 100, and that's yep. it. And that takes us to Felipe Arantes versus Song Yadong. And I'm looking forward to this fight. This mm-hmm. is a fight I like a lot because Felipe Arantes is a huge step up from Bart Kandare, who Song Yadong beat in his debut. You but, watched that fight, and literally five seconds in, you knew that Kandare was going to get slept. Yeah. Like, it was that kind of mismatch. Yeah. But that's the other thing, is that Song Yadong was also clearly a hundred times better than Bharat Kandare. It wasn't like, yeah. oh, we put him in there with this complete can and he had a really hard, difficult fight with him. It was like, no, he just beat Kandare yeah. pillar to post. If you're going to be clearly better than the other guy, then that's the way to let everyone know that. He yeah. absolutely molly him. So he did so, what he should have done. I really, really love Yadong's kickboxing. Like, mm-hmm. dude has a hair trigger for counters. And just seems really composed when he has to press the action, when he's moving forward, stays safe, keeps his feet under him, picks his shots from range really well, doesn't get stuck deep in the pocket. Um, it just seems like a great athlete and a really composed athlete. And he's fighting somebody in Felipe Aranches who is way more experienced and has a diverse skill set of dangerous skills, a really powerful kicker, a blitzing puncher at times, although really in a way that puts him in a lot of danger because he just comes in with his head online throwing. like It's like he saw Char- how Charles Oliveira fights. And he's <laughs> like, yeah, but what if I didn't couple that with a really good wrestling game? What if I just ran into people... And I didn't have any, like, sneakiness to my punches. I just went forward. That, that's that's much more the Felipe Aranches boxing style. That's awesome. <laughs> um, but he's a, a really powerful kicker and a really crafty grappler who's very willing to pull guard to his detriment. A very aggressive grappler. Has, so, anyone, has anyone ever made this Brazilian Portuguese joke? He's a Hockam Sockam Hobot. Has anybody done that yet? <laughs> is, is that novel? Is that does that work? I think that's new. I think, that's new. <laughs> I think you can take credit for Hockam Sockam Hobot. I'm not sure I want to. <laughs> not proud. Um, but so for Yadong, it's just this is a this is a basic test. Like you have somebody in front of you who has dangerous areas everywhere. He's going to test your own depth of technical knowledge and your ability to stay out of danger. But you probably should be able to beat him. Yadong is just a better kickboxer, technically, and a more composed fighter. Uh, he's, I'm sure he's not a better grappler, so if Arantes can get him down, I think Arantes will have a sizable advantage there. But... Arant just doesn't necessarily, he doesn't tend to get people down. He tends to pull guard or let you take him down and then get into the, a scramble. And um, the way he fought, like that fight he had against Josh Emmett, it just gives me zero faith <laughs> in Felipe Arantes. Yeah, I know. I mean, mean, it was impressive because by the end of that fight, he had worked himself back into it. And was suddenly, like, realized he wasn't going to get knocked out. So he was putting hands on Emmett and just kind of staying scrappy and staying busy. But he also went down hard on every punch in the opening round. Not in ways that made you think he was pulling guard, but in ways that made you think that he might be getting knocked out every time. And they were like, is he pulling guard? It seems like a... like. Seems kind of a weird way to pull guard to fall flat on your face and roll around for a minute. 
And why did he get hit so hard in the chin right beforehand? Yeah, he yeah. was. It's not. It wasn't a good look. But but again, the fact that he came back yeah. is what makes this matchup worthwhile and interesting. Yeah, because it, he has the he has enough experience and composure to go through a shit awful fight and come back and fight hard. And we don't really know if Song Yadong has that. Mm-hmm. I'm picking Song Yadong just for being the better athlete, the better technical striker, the more composed fighter. But this is a good hard test for him. And there's no reason, like, I won't be at all surprised if he chases Aranches to the ground and just gets iron barred. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's, this This might sound a little too damning for a guy who is as young as Song Yadong is. What is he, like? Appar- well, he's been 19 for, like, five years. <laughs> Apparently, so- the, the story is that he lied about his age to get fights when he was still uh. really young. So that the UFC number now is supposedly correct, but who knows? What's the UFC number now? It's like 18 or 19. No, oh, very difficult. He looks young, but he he yeah. could just be a guy who looks young. He he yeah, he looks as young. He, he it's, he's 20. It says 20 now. Okay. But I buy it. I'll just say just to make it simple, I buy that. Yeah. Um so this may seem a little unfair because he is supposedly that young. But uh, the question is, like, looking at people that uh, Felipe Aranches has fought, is he Maximo Blanco or is he Kevin Souza? Remember Kevin Souza? Yeah. Um, I love Kevin Souza. Yeah, and he had, like, a really incomplete game and beat Felipe Aranches, whereas yeah. Maximo Blanco has an arguably much more complete game but is a crazy man. Who who just loses his mind the moment he starts fighting, yeah. And so it's like, well, Aranch is, is going to bring that that pace. He's probably like, even if he gets worked over early, he is almost inevitably going to find some way to. He's going to try to get his, to get himself back in the fight. He's going to push the pace. He's going to pull guard. He's going to do whatever it takes to make his kind of fight happen if he can. And how does Song Yadong respond to that as like a young fighter who has not really ever been pushed by a fighter like that, who who was clearly so much better than than uh, or, Barad Kandari? I mean, he's but, actually lost four times, one of them by DQ, but he's lost to especially to to some grinding Russians in his career. So so yeah, it's 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 not that kind of grind, but it's yeah, it is a grind. And uh, and we need to see like how his decision making holds up yep. in the face of something like that. So I, I'm kind of with you. It feels it uh, it does it does honestly feel weird picking such a relatively inexperienced young fighter against like Felipe Aranjas has been doing this for a long ass time. It's been in the UFC for years and years and years now. But uh, if he can just be like Kevin Souza was when he fought Aranjas, like just don't let him pull guard and just sting him and then move away. He seems yeah. to have the timing and the speed to play that kind of game. And one of the most impressive things about that fight with Barak Kandari was how calm he was. Yep. Despite like it's being in like a more or less a hometown environment uh, and having a crowd like going nuts for him. And he was very, very calm and composed. Didn't lose his mind. Like, I think that's a good look. So, I, yeah, I'm expecting him to uh, to have a Ranches' number here. All right. Uh, odds on that fight. Song Yudong is a very mild underdog. Opened at plus 135, dropped down to minus 121, and got all the way to minus 135 before jumping up to minus 109. Is currently at minus 104. Aranches opened at minus 175, went all the way up to plus 113, and then dropped straight down to minus 113 and is currently out at minus 119. So, I, dead even's fine by me, mm-hmm. honestly. I can see why people would be picking Aranches. He's way more experienced. Or he's, I mean, it's not even way more experienced because Song Yudong, like, he's got 16 fights to his name. It's just a much higher level of experience and a lot more years doing it. Yeah. Well, and, you know, Aranches is 28. I mean, it's, it is yeah. a pretty substantial gap in, in terms of yeah. number and quality of opposition. Yeah. All right. That brings us to a bantamweight bout Teruto Ishihara versus Peter Yan. And uh, I think this is you, right? Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm trying to figure out how to talk about it. Um, 
I really like this matchup a lot. Peter yeah. Jan, for those who don't know, is someone, a prospect you should be very excited about seeing in the UFC. He's uh, got some of that like Tom Dukenwa buzz around him where it's like, oh, this is a very violent, um, very uh, athletically impressive small fighter. And and for, you know, he fits right into the bantamweight picture as just a fighter who loves to, to, to knock people the fuck out, uh, likes to throw hands. And that is... That is the interesting thing about this because we've seen a few different kinds of people beat Teruto Ishihara, but not many people have had a great time just trading hands with him. No, um, like he he's it's easy to forget like when people out wrestle Teruto Ishihara. That's been the problem he's been running into. It's easy to forget how he knocked uh, Mizuto Hirota down like three or four times. Hirota, who I don't think got knocked down once by Alexander Volkanovsky, who fought a pretty competitive fight with Volkanovsky, all things considered. And was dominated essentially in, in the, at least the first round of their fight, and was knocked down. I think once more at some other point in their bout as well. It is worth noting that Artem Labov did beat Teruto Ishihara. Yeah, it was all about the low kicks, though. If yeah. Peter Yan doesn't throw right low kicks, then he can't have the same success. I really think that was like the one key. It was I- ironically, not even ironically, just funny because you know the only reason Labov had that low kick in his arsenal was because. Conor McGregor have been training for the rematch with Nate Diaz mm-hmm. <laughs> at the same time, but it worked. Yeah. Um, and that's not really Peter Jan's game. Like he's not this, uh, this like Dutch style kickboxer, uh, throw punches and then chop with a low kick kind of fighter. He likes to kind of counter. He likes to, um, dart in and out with these really quick flashy combinations and the tricky thing is is like he's he's inconsistent he's a young inexperienced fighter and he looks like it because i recall let's see which fight um that i i mentioned this on heavy hands as well but okay his most recent one with uh, matthews matos uh he was like three different fighters at various points of that fight it yeah. was all striking but it's like i don't know that he's he knows what his style is just yet um he was like big single bombs in the first mm-hmm. round. And then he was like more defensive and counter punching and moving around. And then he was like a boxer puncher firing off three, four jabs in a row and then coming in with the right hand, the left hook after, uh, I liked third round the best as like a complete strikers performance, but I don't know that he's going to settle on the right one, the right path to take against Teruto Ishihara. And if he is out there just, trying to cover a pretty substantial gap against a longer, taller fighter, he might eat some of those counter left hands. And I don't, there's probably a fight out there that answers this, but I don't know how Peter Jan responds to being clipped hard uh, on the chin. I, I, I don't recall having seen him really get hurt and have to answer back. So I'm going to pick Peter Jan because he is a really, really impressive, uh, skilled and very talented prospect uh, and has good power and I think is you could knock him for inconsistency, but I think he's also a lot more creative than the mm-hmm. likes of Teruto Ishihara, where he will change his approach if he needs to. So even if he takes the wrong tack in the first round, as long as he survives, he still has a better chance than Ishihara of adapting. But Ishihara is dangerous, man, and 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 Jan is probably going to give him a striking battle. So yeah. I, I'm intrigued. No, Ishihara is kind of like a. Uh... It's kind of it's kind of like he he somehow saw like I'm a lot faster and scrappier and more dynamic, but I'm really love watching Dan late Dan Henderson fight. <laughs> so I'm just gonna take all of, like Dan Henderson's game, and I'm just gonna adapt that, yeah. and that's all I'm gonna do. What if Leota Machida was Dan Henderson? It's yeah, like, <laughs> it's a weird mishmash. Where he just sits there and waits for a left hand, and that's really all Teruto Ishihara does. I think the big thing here, and the thing that we saw too out of the the Labov fight, that it has me picking against Ishihara, A, there's a predictability, which means that despite the fact that he hits really hard, yeah, he doesn't knock a lot of people out, or hasn't knocked a lot of people out lately. Rather, that's, that's been a problem throughout the UFC run in particular. Yeah. Like p- people, even Hirota, they kind of get used to what he's doing after the first round. Yeah. Mo- late since his run of early knockouts, he has not knocked anybody out because now everybody knows who Teruto Ishihara is. He's yeah. a one trick pony with a powerful left hand who that's all he's looking to land. 
And then the other thing is that he likes to pressure, but he won't, he can be pushed. Hmm. He can be pushed back. He can be made not to pressure. He can be, as we saw in like the Canonas fight, he can just be bullied a little, you know? Mm hmm. Or Kanona's just like went on after him and just stayed on him and just leaned on him. And Peter Jan, I don't think A, he's a much, much, much cleaner defensive fighter moving backwards. Like as he's trying to as he's getting out of the pocket, he does a much better job dipping and creating an angle or you know, he'll you'll see him fake one way off the cage and then slip out the other way, do things like that that actually create defense while moving away. He's super crafty for yeah. as, as young as he is. And that allows him to reset and pressure much more effectively and be a much more consistent pressure fighter. Because hmm. he, he does things that keep him, you know, it's not just, oh, I have to be on the front foot and I have to be pressing forward. It's like, no, I can go backwards and I can find a, an angle to reset and take pressure. Mm -hmm. And Ishihara is dangerous off the, off the fence. He still has that left hand. He still has the ability to shock people. He still has speed and accuracy, but I think it just, it all distills down to something that's just a little too one note. Mm -hmm. um, Jan is especially has shown himself to be really pretty good about staying in the pocket and slipping shots. And then, and like, keeping uh, combinations going when he does that. You know, so a little bit of that Robbie Lawler feel that I always just makes my heart beat faster. <laughs> so I, I mean, nothing makes me happier in MMA than to see a fighter get into the pocket, throw two punches, slip a punch, and then, like, throw another punch. It's like, oh, my God, <laughs> you've stayed and created – um, Jan has some of that to him. Yeah. And I, I think that that's just too many. There are too many layers there for me to trust Ishihara. Um, it may come down to a, a durability thing, though. I mean, if Ishihara can crack and, you know, land those one shot, like he, he almost beat, there's an argument he beat Kanones simply because he landed like one shot per round that hurt him. Mm hmm. He he, Shogun against Corey Anderson. Yeah, <laughs> Alberto Quinones. So there is that chance, but without him knocking out or really badly hurting Peter Jan, it's hard for me to see him taking over a fight and winning it on points. Yeah, here. it's it feels like like Jan has the flexibility and the style to win this, but he's going to be in danger the whole time, and that's what makes it a good matchup. Yeah. Like the Ron D fight, D fought his way back into that fight after a bad start, and it was all just uh, Ishihara's ability to really put it on D early that made that fight work for him. Yep. Uh Peter Jan is a large favorite, a prohibitive favorite, you might say. Opened at minus three fifty, adjusted up and down to minus four twenty, and slid out steadily to minus five oh eight. I'm not um, betting on a line that wide. Ishihara opened at my, plus two fifty, adjusted up to plus three forty eight, and has risen steadily to plus three eighty. Lots of very good, strong hype behind Peter Jan, but. Ishihara is he can crack. He may only do one thing. I mean, well, he actually is really, really good ground and pound too. Mm -hmm. He's, he's not a bad wrestler, but yeah, his a, wrestling's coming along still, I yeah, think. But he's a really good sharp ground striker. So God, what if he comes out and just tries to out wrestle Peter Jan? That'll, that'll be suck. interesting. That'll suck. <laughs> yeah. It might happen. I mean, it might happen. It might happen, yeah. Um it it'll be an, it's a good test for Jan. It's a test that's more than a being a minus five hundred favorite. Yeah, for sure. Uh, brings yeah. us to a welterweight bout: Li Jinglong versus Daishi Abe. Um, this should be a fun fight. Abe is young in his career and has been a fun fighter. He's been a fun knockout artist behind a almost pure counterfighting style. 
another there are a lot of fighters on this card that are the most enjoyable kind of counter fighter not uh you know not the people who just sit back and wait for like one shot and every every like five strikes their opponent throws they'll throw one big bomb of a counter but people like Daishi Abe and Yan Zhao Nan and um oh and even Matt Schnell and uh Song Yadong, who are just mm -hmm. trigger counter fighters, where every time you punch, they throw three. Mm -hmm. the, the, mo the most fun fight kind of counter fighters to watch. For sure. Um, they're, not, they're not picky. Yeah, they're not picky. They just, you've thrown something, I'm going to throw many things back at you. That's you how my something. fight works. It hit me or it didn't. You're open. So yeah. <laughs> time, to, time to go. I, yeah, Abe yeah. is very much that kind of counter fighter too. Likes to be busy. Mm -hmm. He's he's really chained to that style. Like, yeah. If you give him a matchup like against Luke Jumo, like he was thoroughly outthought by Luke Jumo because he he didn't know what to do other than just wait for the counter. But this is a very cooperative style matchup. Yeah. I think. Um, it may it, it'll make for a dangerous fight for Li Jing Long early. Like all fights are dangerous for Li Jing Long early. He mm -hmm. wades forward. He just tries to figure out how his opponent is fighting. By throwing poorly set up lead strikes that lead to him getting hit. That is the Li Jing Long style. I will walk forward throwing lots of out offense, and it won't necessarily have a lot of thought presses behind it, but I'll get a lot of data from it. And by the second round, I'll have your timing down and I'll start picking off all your spot all your shots and doing a, a lot better, creating a constantly busy, crafty boxing offense. Um, thing with Abe is I don't trust Abe to be able to adjust or pick up the fight as it goes on. Yeah. I expect Abe to do well early. I expect him to pick Li Jing Long off early. If he can't knock him out though, Li Jing Long is going to be the one adjusting and Abe, like Abe got tired in that fight with, you know, he got exhausted. Yeah. And he got it's, exhausted owning that fight with Jumo. Which is the trouble being the uh, yeah. trigger counterfighter is that you let the other guy decide how fast of a pace you fight at. Yeah. Uh, you just, you're, the trigger is just set off again and again and again. And if the guy is getting used to your counters and not getting hit, you, you're doing nothing but wasting energy at a certain yeah. point. And so it's going to be a dangerous, fun, back and forth brawl of a fight early. And then it should be a fight that Li Jing Long takes over as long as he doesn't get lit up so badly that he ends up in a sort of uh, Jake Matthews situation where he just is constantly waiting back from punishment. Ooh, I, I yeah, don't, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I, Abe doesn't have the athleticism of Matthews, the ability to be dynamic and be surprising for, throughout a fight. So. Right, right. Yeah, that, that's what it really comes down to. Um, yeah. I was not yawning at this fight, by the no, way. No, I know. It's it's a great matchup. I think actually, like again, very cooperative style matchup where Abe only wants to counter, and Li Jing Liang is like not going to be happy with the kind of fight unless he's giving his opponent chances to counter. He's just he's you give him a slow fight. I think he's compelled to come forward and make something happen. Um, and yeah, it, it, I'm with you all the way. It comes down to like creativity. Uh, Abe is just not as organic a fighter as Li Jing Liang. He's He's going to allow Li Jing Liang to set the pace because he's just going to wait for counters. And he is much more predictable in how he counters. It's a lot of right hooks. Yeah. Uh, you know, hint. It's a lot of the same shot. And he he will vary his strikes. He'll think about, but it's really like a choice between three strikes, maybe. Li Jing Liang is a more varied boxer, purely, but also a much better kicker, um, a very good low kicker, and also not a bad wrestler. So yeah. he has some choices to go to uh, to protect himself while he's coming forward against a guy who's just going to be trying to time him. Yeah. Jing Long can be out physical. He can be bullied. He's not the the best athlete in the world, but Abe isn't the kind of fighter to take advantage of that. So Right. Yeah. I think it's the leech. Uh, Li Jing Long is the favorite opened at minus 314, adjusted up and down to minus 384, and has risen steadily since then, if slowly, to minus 346. Uh, Daishi Abe opened at plus 246, adju uh, adjusted up to plus uh, 300 or so, and has dropped steadily to plus 262. Um, 
I mean, if those odds keep closing, that would kind of surprise me. They seem to be closing more and more. I think they've gotten to a point that they're about right. Jing Liang, because he's not a stellar athlete, because he always has bad first rounds, I think it's safe to say like he's not. he should never be a massive favorite. Mm-hmm. But this is still a pretty, like, this is a fight that he should win. Yeah, agreed. All right. And that brings us to a woman's flyweight bout, Jessica Rose Clark and Jessica I. Yeah. Um, Jessica I is still here. She <laughs> she beat Kalindra Faria on the scorecards. And that snapped what was a four-fight losing streak, which was only kept from being a, let's see, a six <laughs> A seven-fight winless streak by uh, the stoppage over Leslie Smith. So, you know, Jessica I is, she's an interesting fighter. She's, she's, she's like, weirdly incapable of adapting. And I guess that's the good thing you could draw from that Kalinda Faria fight is that it was entirely Jessica I trying to wrestle, um, which is like a, a newish wrinkle, I guess. We have seen her use submissions before. We have seen her fight in the clinch before, and we have seen her box before. All of these things at a certain point seem to devolve into like the same brand of frantic scrapping where she just can't control herself. Uh, but the wrestling was a new wrinkle and maybe a wrinkle which will allow her to maintain a little more uh, emotional control in the midst of her fights. Um, I'm you not exactly... On that? <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> no, I'm not, because um, I think Jessica I is kind of a maniac. Um, and, uh, Jessica Rose Clark isn't like, she seems like a very calm, composed, thoughtful fighter. She's a pretty good technical striker. She, she throws combinations. Well, she puts her hands and her kicks together nicely. She can counter, she can pressure. She's a pretty flexible kind of well-rounded kickboxer. And, uh, we also saw some pretty good wrestling and top control from her against Paige Van Zandt, right? She, you know, people booed, but she won that fight largely because she just held Paige Van Zant down. And, you know, it's not like she's bigger than the women Paige is fighting at straw weight, but Paige has performed reasonably well on the ground with uh, better fighters. Uh, yeah, Paige also ruined her arm in that fight. So there's that. But True, there is that. But is that the one where she hit her on the forehead with her? And, yeah. and then kept fighting for another round and a half or so and now has had like several unsuccessful surgeries on said arm. Yeah, but, uh, you know, it's hard to complain about the intelligence of Jessica Rose's Clark, no. Jessica Rose Clark's performance there. And that is like typically the deciding factor in a matchup with Jessica. I is like, is one of these fighters smart? Are they going to like make good decisions and fight to a game plan? And if so, they'll probably find a way to win, even if Jessica has some moments, because it must be said, like, there's a lot of stuff Jessica. I can do well. I bet she's she's probably a beast in the gym. Uh, when she's not like in the midst of a, of a scrap, because you see flashes of a lot of good technique from her. You see jabs, you see combinations, you see head movement, uh, you see a lot of that. But she just can't think when the fight starts. She just like stops yeah. thinking, and I, I think that's going to be the difference. I'm taking Jessica Rose Clark by decision. Yeah, that's always that's been my go-to idea line on Jessica. I, is that like you watch any ten seconds of one of her fights? And you're like, oh, she looks good. Like, yeah, there's like, you see that nice little like duck under takedown she hit on Kalindra Faria where she mm-hmm. turned a corner and all that. And you're like, man, that looked slick. Then you watch a whole round of a Jessica Aya fight and you're like, what the fuck is Frequently, this? you just have to watch the next 10 seconds. And you're yeah. like, what the fuck happened? <laughs> she just loses her shit. She does. And uh, Rose Clark, the, the, big, the, the big question mark here is that Rose Clark is been a pretty bad takedown defender throughout her career. Hopefully that's getting better. She's, it seems like she's moved to syndicate. I think lately. I think the big thing about that Van Zandt fight was her wrestling in general looked a lot better yeah. than it has in the past. Notably, um, despite the fact that she still does a lot of upper body takedowns, which women like she actually does them from an overhook underhook position in the clean. Like she sets a clinch frame and then she hits a trip takedown from it. Uh, no head and arm throws. Yeah, you saw that in, in a Paige Van Zandt fight. She tried it. It didn't work. Paige Van Zandt grabbed a headlock, tried to throw her, immediately got pushed over onto the ground with uh, 
uh, Rose Clark on top, or with Clark on top of her, and then next time Clark tried the same trip uh, from the the clinch lock, body lock, it worked perfectly. Yeah. So I like that. I like how stable Clark is with her consistent striking game, forward and backward. It's just tight, consistent, not flashy. She's not dynamic at all. She's, you know, she doesn't have any of the athleticism of I or Van Zandt. But that's never been the deciding factor of what wins a Jessica I fight. Nope. She's um, just she's steady, and that, that counts yeah. for a lot. Betch Cohea beat her, and that says a lot. And then Kalinda Feria, that that fight was super arguable. I ate a head kick in the first round of that fight that rocked her badly mm-hmm. and largely lost the stand-up battle after that, winning mostly most of the rest of the fight by hitting you by getting into scrambles where she got some positional control. So, I will have some success. Let's put oh, yeah. that way. She, she always has some. It's always a fairly close fight, but then she just she just cannot hold on to success. Yeah, so I'm picking Rose or Jessica Rose Clark too. Not for almost not for any particular thing that that Clark's gonna do, but just because I don't expect I to hold her shit together. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. Uh, Clark is the favorite slightly, opened at minus 170, adjusted up to minus 149, and then has trended way up from, uh, got down to about minus 159, and then has trended way up the past couple of days to pl- minus 133. So late money coming in on I, apparently. Jessica I opened at plus 130, adjusted up and down to about plus, uh, eh, plus 125 or so. And got up as high as plus 133 before she's fallen way down in the past couple of days to plus 109. So, yeah, I mean, don't bet on Jessica I, whatever you do. (laughs) That's that's my free, from somebody who doesn't bet, my free advice is never bet on Jessica I. Just (laughs) purely based on statistics. You should know that already. (laughs) Don't bet on the woman with this record. All right, that brings us to a light heavyweight bout. Ovin St. Pru, Tyson Pedro, and yeah, somebody a couple weeks ago asked me on Twitter, like, so what, like, what weird method do you think, how, how do you see Tyson Pedro clearly winning this fight right up into the moment he loses it in some <laughs> freaky nonsense way? Yeah. And there's definitely some of that going on because that's always a ever present in OSP. The fact that he's just huge and he's at, clearly very powerful and fast for the division. I don't even want to say he's necessarily a great athlete because he's not very coordinated, but he's he's fast and he's strong and he's durable and he's gigantic. He's he is coordinated in a wholly natural way. It is yeah. like no one has ever corrected his technique. And so things look uncoordinated, but he is comfortable with those yeah. movements. Like yeah. the way he can throw a shot while moving backwards. Yeah. Yes. That's his fair. stance, his stance vanishes the moment he starts to move. Yes. Both hands are hanging by his belt line, but he, he has the timing and the, and the speed to make those things work. He understands how that works. So yeah. it's just a perf the perfect, like big fish in a small pond fighter where it's. Yeah. So Pedro is a much cleaner striker um, and a better grappler, especially the better grappler part is probably what's keeping me picking him here because Pedro really likes to lead with his feet a lot. He throws a lot of kicks and when he punches, he's not a comfortable boxer. He has better technique than OSP, but his his striking tends to be a lead into the clinch. Mm-hmm. And he's a more active clinch striker than OSP. I think that's also a saving grace. Is that OSP is just, he's not a busy clinch fighter either. He's really is he busy open. anywhere? No, well, no, he's not busy anywhere. So it's like, you know, OSP is very willing to give up large portions of a range battle while he tries to pick off either moving backwards or just jumping forward through space with big single shots, or he can very clearly be tied up in the clinch and just kind of ground on, or he can be pulled down and into a 
tough fight on the uh, on the floor where he'll be put in a bad position. He's tough. He's tough to t- to hold down because he's so athletic and strong, but he can be. He, and he's such a weird fighter, dude. He, he is, is such like, a weird fighter. He is a slugger with the strangest specialties you could imagine. Yeah, <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense. So, Pedro, like. You watch just even watch OSP's fight with um, Marcos Rogerio de Lima. Like watch the first round of that fight, and you get a good sense of how OSP does against somebody who just throws a lot of kicks at range, mm-hmm. and it's poorly. Like the answer is he just gets kicked a lot. <laughs> and what you know, what really kind of saved him in that fight is he just bum rushed Marcos Rogerio de Lima in the second round got him down and Von Flew'd him. If he doesn't land a Von Flu on Marco Sagerio de, Re- de Lima, and if de Lima's in good enough shape that he doesn't gas himself out throwing one kick every 30 seconds, is that the kind of fight OSP wins? Maybe. I mean, he was losing every minute of that Corey Anderson fight until he hit that head kick that knocked Anderson out. Yeah. Um... It also raises the question of how tough is Tyson Pedro? We don't, you know, this will probably answer that. He'll probably get hit really hard at some mm-hmm. point in this. Um, you know, clearly he got hit by Alir Latifi and survived that, so he's not not a tough fighter. But um, OSP seems to have more just sort of singular shot landings, shot landing ability than he, than Latifi even, who hits like a truck but picks his his spots so rarely mm-hmm. and is so much more willing to grind to and win. And has a, a very specific mode of like yeah. the kinds of punches he likes to throw and the specific order in which he likes to throw them. Yeah. St. Prue could be called more creative on that front. Yeah. So I expect Tyson Pedro to get tested somewhere in here, but if he doesn't get knocked out, um, his grappling chops should really save him from the freak OSP win. And otherwise, that's not a fight that OSP wins. Yeah, it would be perfectly light heavyweight if Tyson Pedro gets taken down and we're like, oh, he doesn't have a bottom game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, if he just gets, if he just holds on to OSP's net, like an arm over his head. Yeah. And just like, no, <laughs> let go. Just yeah. watching Alexia Linek fight Junior Albini again, where Albini's like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to body lock him. I'm going to body lock him because he's giving me underhooks. And then I'm going to trip him to the floor. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, everything above 185 is mostly trash. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm I'm very curious to see how Pedro responds to getting cracked with the big shot that he will inevitably eat in this fight. Because... Yeah, it's like there. I just had this feeling there is this window for the there's this window open for the weirdness of OSP because Pedro he likes to lead with kicks a lot. OSP does tend to get kicked apart, but it's like Pedro is. You know how worried I was when I heard that Pedro went to uh, Jackson Wink. Like we have this very promising fighter, and he's like, oh, his main striking coach is now Mike Winklejohn. I'm like, no, he's gonna like. He's just going to expect people to wait on him to throw three different kinds of kick. And against Elio Latifi, like there were a lot of moments where Latifi was just like, okay, I'm just going to throw something. You've thrown two kicks in a row without a setup. Yeah. You're going for a third one. And the idea for that, that style is, well, if they defend all the kicks, but I, I don't like this style because, <laughs> it's, because it's the, it's the South park, like underwear gnomes of breaking <laughs> styles because you can solve all the attacks with one response. So like only if you were just willing to sit there and do nothing, is it really an effective switch up? Like Which OSP is so willing to just sit there and do nothing. Yeah. But also like Jackson wink guys have a tendency of really getting clipped hard because they are, like it, it could end up being a kind of a trap for someone like Tyson Pedro because yeah. OSP is going to sit there waiting. Pedro's going to get really comfortable just like pe- peppering him with, with kicks that aren't really doing that much damage. And then he's going to get cracked with something huge. So, but there are so many other facets of this fight that it's like Pedro is a fighter who seems to have a strategy in most bouts. 
who seems to be like working towards a specific goal and uh, is always putting himself in position to do that. He might be touching with those kicks, but before long, he's going to be flashing some hands and going into the clinch. He's going to be trying to wear OSP down, make him fight strength for strength. And um, Tyson Pedro is not as good as Glover Teixeira, but if he can wear OSP, the thing is too, like it's going to be close and probably yeah. ugly. Um, and Pedro's going to win a narrow decision, I think. Unless but, he submits OSP, that would be the only thing. Is it like OSP is not a very good defensive tr- grappler? Absolutely true. Yeah, yeah. But you know, he's he's so weird. He's so <laughs> he's, weird. he's so weird. He's it's, the kind of fighter that only works at light heavyweight. And yes, heavyweight. and even absolutely. actually, only really only works at light heavyweight because at heavyweight, everybody's too huge and too tough to be like well i guess we got Derek lewis and we, Derek got- lewis is the archetype for the the fighter who does nothing in the belief that at some point they might be able to knock you out yeah and like the far end of that spectrum is like yoel romero yeah who is like a very thoughtful creative version of that style and osp somehow exists at both ends of the spectrum at <laughs> once where it's like some, he's sometimes very creative and thoughtful and he, I just don't, I can't get a read on him. I love him for that reason. He's fascinating to me. Yeah. All right. Odds on that fight. OSP is the underdog, opened at minus 120, adjusted up to plus 120, jumped up to plus one, as high as plus 135. And then the past few days has dropped from plus 131 all the way down to plus 103. So late money coming in on OSP. Pedro. Opened at minus 120, dropped down to minus 145, got down as low as minus 158 or so, and then has jumped up in the past couple days to minus 127. Um, I'm fine with these lines being really close. Tyson Pedro, I mean, he's already, you know, he's kind of already run up against the actual good, reasonably decent light heavyweight mountain. Yeah. And just got firmly beaten by Ilir Latifi. Coming back and beating Saperbek Safarov doesn't tell us anything other than he's still better than the trash end of the division. So, was P got submitted by Latifi in his last fight? Saperbek Safarov? No, OSP. OSP, yeah, yeah. I just don't remember any of Ilir Latifi's fights, apparently, because I also completely forgot until last week that he had fought Tyson Pedro. Yeah. So, all right. The battle of guys who just lost to Alir Latifi. I'm, I'm down yeah. with it. Uh, that brings us to our main event. Welterweight bout Donald Cerrone versus Leon Edwards. And I am picking, I'm just going to say this up front. I'm picking Leon Edwards to win this fight. I am not doing it for any really good <laughs> structural reason. Yeah. Like the, there's nothing really about the basic way that Leon Edwards fights that beats Donald Cerrone. Right. When's the last time that Donald Cerrone got lost a fight because he got held down and just out wrestled or lost a fight to a slow paced single shot kind of striker? Yeah, well, the Darren Till fight would be the except it would be that, but I guess so, yeah. Till like is Leon Edwards that level of pressure fighter? Cuz no. That's He's the real been, difference is is that yeah. a fighter who was just going to stand at range waiting for the single shots. Yeah. Like Darren Till is like a, a hyper confident pressure fighter. We've talked over and over again about one of the problems with Leon Edwards is that he's really not a confident striker. Mm-hmm. He throws single shots with a lot of power and he's got good technique on him. And he can even like we even saw in his fight with uh oh, who did he just beat um Peter Sabota? Like, he even put together some good combinations in that fight, too. But there was also a moment, like, where he got stung in the pocket by Sabota, and he's just, like, back way, way off. And he's just mm-hmm. like, nah, I'm out. Getting way out of dodge. Let's go work on some wrestling again and, you know, put put a wrestling grind on this guy. And he's an excellent wrestler. He has really shown himself to be a very highly technically proficient, dogged untirable wrestler wrestler he's a great chain wrestler he really yeah, puts his takedown attempts together and his his mat wrestling is similarly like very well connected 
he's unfortunately though not a damaging wrestler. So he's very much just a blanket. Like he's highly controlling, highly blanketing. And like I said, when's the last time that worked against Don Cerrone? Rafael Dos Anjos had a round of it back in 2013. Like the middle round of that fight that was I rewatched that fight just to try to find something like it. And it was still a really close fight. Yeah, you do you do have to ask yourself the question, like, who's the best wrestler? Because Cerrone has faced a strange dearth of people who, like, really want to take him down. Yeah, especially lately. So, you know, like, Leo so Edwards no is there. legitimately the best takedown artist he has faced in some time. But, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you bank on Leon Edwards just out-wrestling Donald Cerrone. Right. And then if it's a slow-paced kickboxing battle, yeah, Leon Edwards has the power, and he has the ability to pressure in spurts, which is Donald Cerrone's major handicap. Um, But is it enough just consistent, unrelenting pressure to break Donald Cerrone down, especially early in the ways that Cerrone has trouble with? Because Cerrone's chin still hasn't... Like, he got knocked out by Darren Till... But as we saw in the Yancey Medeiros fight, and as we even saw in the Jorge Masvidal fight, and even in the Till fight, like it takes multiple strikes to hurt him. Yeah. You can't just land a big shot and suddenly Donald Cerrone's out. He's oh, not yeah. nearly that far gone. So if Edwards can't put him out early, Donald Cerrone tends to get more composed. He tends to get better at dealing with pressure. He tends to get be just a much better put together fighter as fights go on much cleaner, much more mindful of his defense, better timing, better combinations. I'm just Edwards is so much younger and so much less shop worn and more dynamic at this point in his career and faster. And he hits hard and he's got a blanketing top game. I don't, I don't feel like all those things fit together to be an archetype of what beats Donald Cerrone, but I'm not picking Donald Cerrone. <sighs> yeah, I'm, I like agree with you across the board, which is what, what makes it funny that I'm going to pick up. I am going to end up picking Donald Cerrone because, <laughs> like, uh, heavy hands this week. I came in essentially saying all of this, and Pat sort of convinced me uh, because we were talking about the style matchup, and it's like, yeah, what like what is Leon Edwards going to do to make this fight his? Um, it, like it, it really does seem if he cannot just flatly out wrestle Cerrone round after round after round, then it's like I don't know what he's gonna do. <laughs> and it's worth noting that Edwards gets a lot of his starts a lot of his chain takedowns in the clinch and in the body lock. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, Cerrone yeah. is an excellent is excellent at breaking the clinch and breaking body locks and getting back out to space. Much like Holly Holm, they both have that. Yeah skill that they've built up in their time at Jackson Wink where somebody tries to put up tries to lock them up and they just immediately shuck and step out on an angle and get back to range. And I was thinking about that. I if I recall the Brian Barbarina fight of Leon Edwards, uh -huh. there were some moments where he did get stalled out in the clinch and took some shots. And it's uh -huh. like Theroni is a pretty good clinch fighter. Uh if you're going to allow him to work to an angle with a collar tie, he will fire some hard knees up the middle. Um tends to kind of build as the fight goes on and it's weird because both of Leon Edwards last two fights I rewatched them and he's actually doing a better job of like answering and pulling the trigger than I remembered uh -huh. but never as much as I hope for or expect yeah um and, and I don't know if he's ever going to get over that hurdle but if he if he ends up in a a striking battle at pace with Cerrone like again, if he cannot just control Cerrone with wrestling, then I just don't think he has the volume uh, to compete with him. And he he like he he's more likely than a lot of other guys Cerrone's fought to put him out with a single shot. He does seem to have a lot of power, a lot of speed more than anything. Yep. Um, and yeah, if Cerrone doesn't see a shot coming, it, it, that could d decisively change the fight. But in the aggregate, Edward's style just doesn't work like that. It just like. I don't know. And then he's going to probably spend a lot of time at a range where Cerrone is working his kicks uh, and just getting to use the full breadth of his striking arsenal. So I'm going to go with Cerrone, um, even though yeah. like my, my gut feeling is that Edwards is going to win this still yep. because 
he's just younger and uh, I'm younger, Cerrone has, faster, hits harder, and not just faster by nature, but like Cerrone has been looking yeah. slower than his old self, notably yeah. in recent fights and. Even in the Anti Medeiros fight, like he just got tagged up a lot by Anti Medeiros early, and then yeah. finally started to find Medeiros' timing to land the counters as Medeiros kept running forward with both arms flailing at the same time. Yeah, and and if 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 like Cerrone is a little more reluctant, if it, it could be harder at the time, just like more sparse striking um, yeah. offerings. But also, if you give Donald Cerrone the chance to ramp up the pace, he'll probably do it. So. It's yeah, my my gut for whatever reason, for many uh, difficult to define reasons, still says Edwards, but I'm gonna pick Cerrone. Yep, I, I'm I'm taking the gut on this one, and Edwards is the favorite. Opened at plus one fifteen, adjusted down to p- minus one seventy eight or so, and has fallen steadily out to minus two oh three. Cerrone opened at minus one fifty five, adjusted up to plus one fifty two big swing there and has gone up and evened out at about plus 165. Um, I, yeah, I can't really, you know, I can't really get a good read on this fight, mostly just because I think stylistically it's a good matchup for Cerrone and Mm -hmm. um, just in the shifting, in the shifting sea of careers and ages and timeline and all that, it just doesn't feel like a fight he's going to win. Yeah, I'm with you on that. All right. Well, at this point, we should wrap everything up. You can find me on Twitter at these ain't time, and you can find Connor on Twitter at Boxing Bush B U S C H. You can find both of us over at BloodyElbow.com. We'll be back next week with the MMA depressed us because we do not have a UFC card next week, and then we'll be back in two weeks with the tough finale and UFC 226 doing a double header. Uh, somebody put out the idea of maybe getting Dan Tom from MMA Junkie on here. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I think we might like to do that. That would be kind of fun. Um, yeah, sounds fun. One. So we might do that for our next one. And uh, in the meantime, you'll find us over at Bloody Elbow day in, day out, doing all our typing. And uh, <laughs> we'll be uh, – give us a like, thumbs up on YouTube. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, MMANation.com, D-O-T-C-O-M, all spelled out. That's where you find all the Bloody Elbow shows, news, videos, analysis, all that stuff we do. We'll be back with uh, If I Did It and Knuckle Up and maybe a six-round retro and Depressed Us and all that stuff next week. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in, and we'll see you soon.